In keeping with our standard operating procedure, the next few moments are devoted to silent prayer, giving each of you the opportunity to rebound if necessary. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us to these things and give us the concentration necessary to assemble this portion of the Word of God into our souls. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 12, verse 37. Matthew chapter 12, verse 37. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. So what does this mean? Well, for by your words, this means those words that reflect your faith alone in Christ alone. You will be justified. And by your words, that is expressing salvation by works in this case, you will be condemned. Now here we have a question of means and results. It's the same question that comes up in Romans. And it doesn't mean that you have to uh, proclaim that Jesus Christ is your Savior with words in order to be saved. It means as a result of your salvation, you will proclaim that Jesus Christ is your Savior and you'll probably witness to others as well and tell them how Jesus Christ is their Savior as well if they would only believe. So for by your words, that is a reflection of your faith. Your words, they reflect your faith, especially when you're witnessing to someone or if you tell someone Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that is a reflection of your faith. So you will be justified by your words and you will be condemned by your words. And condemnation by your words is expressing, expressing salvation by works. And someone will say, you must do this and do that to be saved. Well, they're condemned by those words if they've never believed in Christ. So you see, means and results. A question that was answered in Matthew chapter 12, verse 34. This question has already been answered concerning means and result. And we studied Matthew 12, 34. So you believe in Christ with your stream of consciousness, your frontal lobe. It's a change of mind about Christ. And you believe it with your mind. So as a result, you proclaim your faith. And you reject Jesus Christ in your mind, in your frontal lobe, in your mental attitude. Is your mental attitude toward Christ one that says, He is my Savior? Or is your mental attitude toward Christ one that says, I reject him. And this is what is brought out in Matthew 12.34 and is extrapolated on in Matthew 12.37 so that we understand that uh, we cannot confuse means and result. The result of faith alone in Christ alone, more than likely you'll express it with your words. The result of not believing in Christ, more than likely you'll express it with your words. And that is, you'll tell everyone the only way to go to heaven is to believe in Allah and Muhammad, his prophet. And that would be condemnation by your words. But guess what? As it said earlier in 1234, what you say with your mouth originates from what you thought. So salvation started when you believed it in your mind and you don't have to proclaim it. It's a result. So we cannot confuse means and result and many churches today, unfortunately, confuse means and result. And therefore they take a passage in Romans and confuse it and say, you must confess Christ with your mouth. That's why you must come forward and confess him with your mouth. No, you're confusing means and result. Because you've believed, you will confess him with your mouth. And they're confusing the means of salvation. We've studied the means of salvation. And I won't give you all those verses related to salvation because you should know them already. So now we move from 1237 to 1238. And we have a change of subject here. Our Lord's about to get tough once more with the religious crowd. And the focus here is going to begin to a shift from uh, what he is teaching to them, saying that uh, the kingdom of heaven is uh, at hand, he's going to shift uh, that focus and change it pretty soon. But first he's going to give them another butt-chewing 
uh, just, uh, just to give them one more chance. And then in 1238, Then some of the experts in the law, along with some Pharisees, answered him, Sir, we want to see a sign from you. The fact that they said sir indicates their lack of believing in Christ. They're calling him sir. That's an insult to call the Lord sir. You call the Lord Lord. And that's what all the disciples did except for Judas Iscariot who called him rabbi. That too an insult. He wasn't a self-righteous rabbi or teacher. He was the son of God. And so Peter would call him Lord. Judas Iscariot would call him rabbi. And the teachers of the law would call him sir. Sir, we want to see a sign from you. And then in 1239, But he answered them, An evil and adulterous generation asks for a sign. But no sign will be given it except the sign of prophet Jonah or of the prophet Jonah. So he answered them and said, An evil and adulterous generation. Now, adulterous doesn't mean actual adultery. Even though he chewed them out for having mental adultery, they thought they were perfect because they never committed actual physical adultery, but they did it in their minds all the time. So he chewed them on that one to let them know that they were sinners and not perfect under the law. But adulterous here does not mean actual adultery. And it does not mean adulterous in that uh, a woman will substitute another man for her husband as in adultery. Uh, in, in this situation, it, there is a substitute. It's not like the woman substituting another man for her husband, but this is a substitute of good works for salvation rather than faith alone in Christ alone. And when they substitute good works for salvation, they might as well be adulterous. They've substituted something uh, for what God has uh, designed. God designed right man for right woman. God designed us to simply believe in Christ. Any addition of works to it, as the Pharisees always did, would be adulterous. So an evil and adulterous generation asks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. And this means they had a miracle emphasis over message emphasis. They had an emphasis on miracles. They wanted to see Jesus Christ produce another miracle. Why? Because if he would have just uh, uh, performed another miracle, what would they have said? Oh, you did that from Beelzebub again. And they would go around, see, this man is of the devil. Nobody does this. He's from Beelzebub. They only wanted to see it uh, because they loved to see miracles, for one thing. And the other thing, it wouldn't have changed their mind. They would have still criticized our Lord. So they had a miracle emphasis over message emphasis. They didn't want to hear what the Lord had to say, such as uh, you are uh, just like a, a Jonah and the only sign you're going to receive is the sign of Jonah because they understood that uh, Old Testament story and therefore it was an insult to them. They didn't want to hear that. They didn't want to hear a message. They wanted to see a miracle. 1240, For just as Jonah was in the belly of the huge fish for three days and three nights, so the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. The heart of the earth here is referring to Sheol. That's S-H-E-O-L. Sheol. That's the Old Testament uh, place for both paradise. Paradise is in Sheol. And it's also the place of Hades, which is torments. That too is in Sheol. Today we go to heaven. Then they went to Abraham's bosom or to Hades, which is torments. So Sheol is where Abraham's bosom and Hades are. <coughs> and the Pharisees knew that uh, they would all, they would all go to Sheol, and they all hoped to go to Abraham's bosom instead of uh, Hades. That was their hope. They didn't know if they would or not. They're religious people. Religious people always on their deathbeds get scared because they don't know if they're saved or not. And a lot of legalistic people who are saved get scared because they start to think about all the sins they committed in their lifetime and they think to themselves, oh no, I wasn't good enough. Of course you weren't. Christ was good enough for you. And that's part of their punishment for never coming to realize that. So a lot of believers die miserable deaths and not even know where they're going because they know they haven't been good enough to match God's righteousness. 
but they should know better anyway. So Jesus tells them that after three days he will come back from Sheol resurrected. This is what the reference is to. For just as Jonah was in the belly of the huge fish for three days and three nights, so the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth in Sheol. And he tells them this to uh, explain to them the resurrection for three days and three nights. Then in 1241, the people of Nineveh will stand up with this generation at the judgment and condemn it because they changed their mental attitude about Christ from the preaching of Jonah. Yet something greater than Jonah is here. I don't know if you have repentance there or not. I didn't take time to look it up in uh, your translations. If you have King James, it's most definitely translated repentance. NIV, they may have done a little better. So the people of Nineveh, these are Assyrian people. These are the most despised by the Gentiles. Or the, these are the most despised Gentiles by the Jews, rather. The Jews hated the Assyrians. They hated them in the day of Jonah. And in fact, Jonah hated the Assyrians so much he didn't want to go give them the gospel. But the Lord said, you're going to the Assyrians to give the gospel. But he got on a boat and sent, or a ship and said, I ain't going there, I'm going the other way. I don't want to go to these Assyrians. I hate the Assyrians. They're my enemies. I'm not going to go to them. So he got on a boat, and then a big storm came, and they, they tossed him over because he said, I bet I'm the reason. And he was. And they threw him over, and then a big fish came along and uh, swallowed him. And he lived in the belly of a fish. You don't believe that? Well, it's true. He was in the fish, and he was able to breathe there and live there for uh, three days and three nights until he was vomited up by the fish onto land and that's what happened to Jonah and he's making a comparison here saying I'm going to be like that I'm going to be in the earth for uh, three days and three nights and that the belly of the earth Sheol he's going to be in paradise three days and three nights and they, the Jews remember hated the Assyrians and that's the point of 1241 the people of Nineveh will stand up with this generation at the judgment and condemn it because they changed their mental attitude from the preaching of Jonah. Yet something greater than Jonah is here. In other words, you Jews, it's time to wake up. It's time to wake up to the gospel. It's time to believe in me. Look, the Assyrians whom you hate are going to stand up in judgment of you unless you believe in me. In other words, the Assyrians will be there and they'll be saved. And these Jews... Who these uh, religious Jews will get up without salvation and they'll stand before the Lord and he'll say, I don't know you, uh, get away from me and they'll go to hell. And the people of Nineveh who believed in Christ will be right there in heaven with the Lord. And so he's starting to foreshadow some things right now concerning the fifth cycle of discipline. He's saying, your time's up, people. I've given you chance after chance. And I, there's going to be sign after sign. You're asking for a sign. You've gotten enough already. And you've rejected every one of them. I'm not going to give you any more signs. My period of grace with you is over because you reject me. And that's what he's saying. And his period of grace with them is over. He offered it. They rejected it. He's going to move on. And that's what we all should do in our personal lives. You offer the gospel to someone. They reject it twice. Move on. Don't bother with them anymore. Not concerning the gospel. You might still talk to them as buddies or whatever. And there's nothing wrong with that. But concerning the gospel, keep your mouth shut. They rejected it. And then he's going to talk about another Gentile. You see, he's bringing in something here. He's, he's starting to change focus. The focus up until here has been on the Jew. Jews believe in Christ. You religious nuts believe in Christ. Believe in me is what he would say. All you people who are criticizing me now believe in me. And he would do a miracle. And they still wouldn't believe. And then he'd chew them out harder and they still wouldn't believe. Until finally they wanted to murder him. And so he says it's, it's time to give up on these people. And it was. They received their grace. They received their period of grace. And now he's talking about judgment to them saying you received it, you rejected it, you're going to be judged. 1242, the queen of the south, queen of Sheba, a Gentile, and she was the richest woman in the world at that time of uh, Solomon. She was Arabic. Now, if you know anything about history, you know the conflict between Jews and Arabs. It's constant. 
the conflict between Ishmael and Isaac. It's a constant conflict in history that goes down to this very day. And if we think as people of the United States we can make a peace between the Jews and Arabs, we are uh, full of arrogance. There is no way. This has been a conflict that has always existed, will always exist, existed in the Lord's day. And you give the Palestinian Arabs their own state and they're still going to be at war with the Israelites. It's not going to solve a thing. And you give them freedom, they don't understand freedom, they understand hatred. They hate the Jew and that's all they understand. That's all they've ever understand, understood from the day of uh, Ishmael all the way till the day of now. And Hagar's children will never have affinity for the Jew. Never. It's been prophesied and that's the way it's always been. And that's the way it will continue to be. And so he brings up an Arab, some an Arab, a race that the Jews hate. Jews hate Arabs. Arabs hate Jews even more. And that's the way it's always been. And the queen of the south, the queen of Sheba, will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it because she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Now Solomon, with all his problems, still was able to give the gospel to the queen of Sheba and she still believed in Christ, even though he had so many women that uh, he went off and worshipped other gods sometimes because he got uh, messed up with the wrong women. Thousands of wrong women. And women won't make you happy. And young men, don't think that if you have a lot of women, it'll make you happy. No, it'll make you 20 times more miserable. There's one man for one woman. Wait for the Lord to bring that woman to you. It doesn't mean you can't date if your parents allow you to. It just means that to be patient when it comes to the serious matters, especially when it comes to sex. Wait for marriage for sex. And that's what that is all about. And that cut off right at the right time so you would hear that loud and clear. <laughs> Wait for the Lord. If you don't, you'll end up like a lot of people around here who have a lot of problems. And if you have sex outside of marriage, it causes problems. So the queen of, of the south, the queen of Sheba, will stand up in judgment with this uh, generation and condemn it because she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And she ended up getting the gospel as well. Yet something greater than Solomon is here. He's just chewed him out and now he's telling him, Look, the Son of God, the Messiah, I am here. And yet they're still gnashing their teeth, wondering how to murder the fellow. And then in 1243, now he's going to uh, talk about uh, demon possession and how he cast out demons. When the unclean spirit goes out of a person. Now this is when a demon is cast out of a person. That's what it means. It. This is referring to the soul of the once demon-possessed person. It's not referring to the demon. When the unclean spirit goes out of a person, when a demon is cast out, it, the soul of the uh, person, uh, the once demon-possessed person, not the demon, uh, travels through waterless places. You would think that would have to deal with the demon, but it doesn't. It's talking about the soul of uh, probably, the indication is it's the soul of one of the uh, Pharisees there who had been demon-possessed, and Jesus Christ cast out the demon from the Pharisee. That's the indication. So their soul, that is that Pharisee's soul that is in the indication that is uh, there, that is implied here, travels through waterless places looking for refreshment and does not find it. This means there is no refreshment found in legalism, no refreshment found in religious activity, no refreshment found in Judaism. So what happened here, and the indication is pretty strong, there was a Pharisee who had been demon-possessed, and Jesus Christ came along and threw the demon out of the Pharisee. And instead of the Pharisee believing in Christ after something so miraculous, he went around looking through waterless places. Remember, the gospel is the water of the word. But he went to waterless places. That is works, salvation by works. Looking for refreshment and does not find it. He wasn't saved by his works. He thought if he could just be a better person, that would never happen to him again and therefore he would be heaven bound. And then in 1244, then it says, I will return to my house that I came from. This house here is 
return to the temple. And that this is this part here in 1244 is talking about the demon. The demon says, I will return to my house that I came from. He had been cast out. And we have to understand this is all from the Greek and we have to understand it and put it together and understand that it's, it's referring to the demon in one place and to the man in the other place and to the soul in the other. So to start off with, it, it says, when the unclean spirit goes out of the person. Well, that's definitely talking about the demon when it's cast out. Then secondly, it says it. This is referring to the soul of the once demon-possessed person looking for salvation through works. Going through waterless places. Doesn't have the water of the word. Doesn't want the water of the word. Doesn't want the salvation message. Looking for refreshment and doesn't find it. Then it says, now it switches and it's talking about the demon. And the demon says, I will return to my house that I came from. Return to his temple. And when it returns, it finds the house empty. Swept clean and put in order. And that means when he goes back to the house that is the body of the Pharisee, it's, it's swept clean and put in order. What's that mean? The religion of Judaism got a hold of it, swept it clean. He thinks he's clean. And set it in order all through this religious activity. But who did he set the house in order for? 12.45, we'll see the answer. I know it's difficult. We'll go back over it one more time so that you get it. Then it goes and takes with it seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they enter in and live there, and the final condition of that person is worse than the first. It will be that way for this evil generation as well. In other words, once you reject Christ as an unbeliever, you move deeper into the cosmic system. You become worse, not better. And this man had been presented the gospel after the demon was cast out of him. And the indication is Pharisee. Either way, he was a religious person because he's trying to sweep clean his soul and he can't do it. Only thing he's doing is sweeping clean the soul for more demons to enter through self-righteousness. That's what it's meaning. Then it goes and takes with it seven other spirits more evil than itself and they enter in and live there and the final condition of that person is worse than the first. It will be that way for this evil generation as well because they reject Christ, they move deeper into the cosmic system and become worse. Anytime an unbeliever rejects Christ, he becomes worse and worse as and gets deeper involved in the cosmic system. And many people, after hearing the gospel, if they reject it, they go off the deep end into, co into Satan's cosmic system. It's happened with many evil rulers in the past. Happened with Pharaoh constantly rejecting Christ. And eventually uh, he ended up, of course, being a type of a mad maniac, remember, who drowned his whole army. So again, we'll go over uh, the whole thing just so you get it straight and to make sure that I set it straight. And then in, uh, let's go back to 1243. When the unclean spirit goes out of a person, that's when a demon is cast out of a person. It, the soul of the once demon-possessed person, not the demon, travels through waterless places. That's the soul of the Pharisee, the soul of the religious person. He needs the water of the word, the gospel, but he travels through waterless places, traveling, re referring to working for salvation looking for refreshment and doesn't find it. And you would think it has to do with the demon, but it doesn't. Then in 1244, now this one I led you astray a bit. This is the man still talking about his soul, so you can strike that out in your notes and change it. I think I did say it refers back. It doesn't. Let me get it straight for you. 1244, then it says, that is the same soul of the unregenerate Pharisee, the unregenerate religious person. Then he says, I will return to my house that I came from. The house is a reference to the temple, the Pharisee returning to the temple. Instead of going to the cross, he goes to the temple. Instead of looking at Jesus Christ as the Savior, he goes back to the temple. And I'm sorry I got that wrong, but I knew it in my mind. I just communicated it wrong. So returning to the temple refers to returning to Judaism. Returns back to it gets exercised by the Lord and then returns back to the temple. 
doesn't even believe in Christ for what he did. Then, when it returns, it finds the house empty, swept clean, and put in order. This is a reference to the religion of Judaism or any religion. It sweeps it clean and uh, sets it in order in terms of uh, legalism. And that's what legal legalism sets it in order. Religion sweeps it clean. That's how the that's how the religious people look. The religious people look at it this way. I will sweep I will sweep it clean, sweep my soul clean by becoming more religious. And in legalism, I'll set it in order by all the laws. You see, the laws have an order to them, and they follow legalistic laws. Then it goes and takes with it seven other spirits more evil than itself. Now there's a switch to the demon. Been talking about the soul of the unbeliever who's working for salvation. Now switches to the spirits. Then it goes and takes with it seven other spirits, demons, more evil than itself, and they enter in and live there. And the final condition of that person is worse than the first. It will be that way for this evil generation as well. And what he's saying is uh, some of those people who had been uh, exercised of demons and didn't believe in him, uh, some of those demons are going to come back and possess that same person except uh, seven times more and worse. And this condition will be worse. And this is a reference also to the fact that when you reject Christ, you become worse as an unbeliever. You might start out as wonderful and we note this from the cosmic system versus the what is called the divine dinosphere. And it applies both to believer and unbeliever. The unbeliever can live under divine establishment and not and he's never received the gospel, he's never wanted it, never received it, but he's able to function under divine establishment. He's able to get married, have a wife, have a family, and be a good father and uh, maybe even join the military, be patriotic, or whatever he's doing, he's functioning under divine establishment. Now, with this unbeliever ever comes in contact with the gospel, and common grace is given to this unbeliever, and then the unbeliever says, as it says earlier, blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, and says, I do not believe, then this unbeliever moves into the cosmic system. And he might have started out okay as a fellow, somebody you might want to even hang around and enjoy life with. But he'll end up bitter, and he'll end up someone under the cosmic system. And a lot of cases, they start out very conservative. And you would think they were believers. They start out conservative. They, they vote for the right people, and they're a very uh, patriotic, pro-country, and uh, pro-freedom and all that. And then, when they uh, receive the gospel and reject it, they go off the deep end and become extraordinarily liberal. And this is, this is what it's indicating here. This is what happens to the unbeliever who comes in contact with the gospel. And in this case, he's referring to the fact that he exercised one of the religious people and they rejected him and did not... Uh, believe in him even though they had been exercised of the demon now in 1246 we get to Jesus's true family 1246 while he was still speaking to the crowds his mother and his brothers they would be the four half brothers and that would be James the author of James Jude the author of Jude Joseph and Simon and they came and stood outside and they asked to speak to him, that is, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then in 1247, someone told him. You see, look, while he was still speaking to the crowds, he was in the middle of a message. And he was giving a very good message. And he was still chewing out the religious crowd. And then, while he's in the middle of the message, somebody has the gall to walk up to our Lord and interrupt him and say, your mother and brothers are standing outside and want to speak to you. He had a message to give. And they interrupted him. So what, he, so what did he do? He kept on with the message and made a doc, another doctrinal point. To the one who had said this, Jesus replied, he's about to teach to the one who interrupted him some doctrine. Who is my mother and who are 
my brothers. In other words, what I'm saying right now, this is our Lord speaking. In other words, what the Lord is saying right then is far more important than his mothers and brothers wanting him outside. What he's saying is, why would you bother me? I'm in the middle of a message. You don't interrupt me during a message. So he says, "Who?" but he didn't say it just like that. He just goes on and gives some doctrinal points. Who is my mother and who are my brothers? And then, pointing toward his disciples, his students who had been with him this whole time, his students who had made Bible doctrine number one, even though they did fail on occasion, but who doesn't? But they had made the choice to follow the Lord. Remember, they just left everything and followed the Lord, indicating their uh, number one priority was Bible doctrine. And he pointed to those who had made Bible doctrine number one, and he said, These are my mother and my brothers. In other words, don't interrupt me. And, and, and also this indicates family ties. When it comes to eternity, uh, family ties aren't important whatsoever. Not in eternity. They are now. And there's the divine institution of family, which is very important. But in eternity, family is really meaningless. Now, you will know your uh, relatives in heaven. And you'll meet them and you'll be glad to see them in heaven. Those who have passed on and and those who will pass on later after you do. You'll meet them, you'll recognize them. You'll recognize your husband, you'll recognize your wife. But those relationships are meaningless now. Well, you'll recognize them, but uh, there, it's not going to be the same. There's no marriage in heaven. There's really no family in heaven except royal family. We'll all be there as brothers and sisters, and we'll be married, of course, to Jesus Christ, as it were, as it's described. So he's making a point that, uh, that you've got your eyes on human things. This guy who interrupted him. He's saying, uh, you've got your eyes on life. You've got your eyes on the details of life. I'm living my life in the light of eternity. And so are my disciples who've made Bible doctrine number one. These are my true brothers and uh, mothers, as it were. In other words, these, these people who have made Bible doctrine number one, they're my family. So what that they're outside? I'm in the middle of a message is what he's saying. Now some of us might look at that. We might hear someone say that and say, that man has no heart. Well, it would be understandable because of the protocol of culture. But Jesus Christ cared not for the protocol of culture. In fact, remember, he told a man who had just lost his father, forget the funeral and follow me. Cold-hearted, you would think, but no. He had a point. He had a message. He wasn't going to be on the earth long and he had to get these things across. And there's something more important than the details of life. And that is to live your life in the light of eternity. That is to make sure Bible doctrine comes number one. And Jesus Christ here is indicating that in, in his life, under the prototype spiritual life that he was living in the light of eternity, family ties are meaningless. And it's true. Now that doesn't mean uh, you forsake your family and you don't get weird about it. We're in the world. We're not of it, but we're in it. And we have families and we love our families naturally. But our Christ, uh, our Lord Jesus Christ, is, is making a point here. He's saying don't get distracted by familial ties. Don't get distracted by friendship ties. Don't get distracted by people, period. That's the point he's getting across. And what he's saying is, I, as the Lord Jesus Christ, living the prototype spiritual life, am not distracted by my mother or my brothers. What he's saying is, I'm not distracted by them right now. I'm in the middle of a message. I am fulfilling my destiny. And what he's saying to this man is, don't be distracted by it. And don't be distracted when the big sword comes down in between you and your family members and it will happen if you're growing in grace. And they'll say to you, you mean you go to that church every night? Well, you're damn right you do. That's where you need to be. But they'll bring it up and make it an issue. And they'll use it as a sword. Well, well don't fight back. They're in the cosmic system. They're going to attack you. And our, our, our position is not offensive. And we don't get up in their face and say, well, blah, 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 blah. We just ignore them. We don't have to fight over it. 
If you know you're right, why defend yourself? Why justify yourself? They're the ones who are going to need justifying, not you. So there will be family members and friends who try to suck you away from the word of God. And they will say, well, that sounds a little cultish. Well, you know it's not a cult yourself. You know that you're free to come, you're free to go, you're free to do whatever you want to do. Now, in a cult, uh, the guy would get up and say, uh, you must be here, or go knock on your door and say, where have you been, and try to make you feel guilty and all of that. This isn't a cult. And uh, if you've been my flock for a while and you look a little slack for no reason than just to be slack, I'll chew you out. That's my job, but I'm not going to bother you on your time off or wherever you are and say, get to church. None of my business, see. But a cult is uh, different. A cult makes uh, people feel guilty, and there's guilt involved. And if anything, these uh, other churches around here are cults. They make you feel guilty if you don't follow exactly their taboos. And if you go out in some church parking lots and light up a cigarette, they're going to make you feel guilty. That's cultish. Here we have freedom. Free to come, free to go, free to accept it, free to reject it. Free! And freedom is a wonderful thing. So it's not a cult, and you just have to have that uh, straightened out in your mind. And what other people say, well, you shouldn't care, and that's what our Lord is saying. Family ties aren't that important. It's something he's been trying to say for quite a while. He brought it up with the sword, and now he brings it up here. Well, every time he had a chance to point out that uh, don't get swept away by relationship with people, in other, in other words, stay with doctrine, he makes that point. He makes it very clear. So they would probably think his mother wants him and now he's just dissed her and said, I'm too busy. Well, he was. He had something important to be doing. Then in 1250, For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. And that's the point. Now, turn in your Bibles to 1 John 3, 23. This is the command. And he's about to describe something called the royal family of God. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. 1 John 3, 23. What is the will of the Father? That's the question you should ask when you read this verse. When you read Matthew 12:50 on your own and you say, For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. You should come up with a question and say, What is the will of the Father? 1 John 3:23. Now this keeps now this is corrected translation. It keeps on being the commandment even till this day. Now this keeps on being his commandment, that is God the Father that we believe in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as He gave us the commandment. So what is the will? Well, it's very simple. Now this keeps on being His commandment, that we believe in the name of the Son, Jesus Christ. Why? So that we can have eternal salvation. That's one part of it. Now don't mix number one and number two. You can be saved and never follow number two. Most people are saved and never ever follow number two, the second part of the verse. So they are doing the will of the Father in that they believed in Christ and they're saved, but they may never love one another. Remember, that's the integrity envelope. Number seven and number eight on the flat line. Impersonal love or personal love for God and impersonal love for all mankind. So the second, and love one another, well, that's post-salvation, epistemological rehabilitation. The only way you're ever going to come to love one another in this big family called the royal family of God is to have doctrine. The only way to have true love in marriage, the only way to have true love in friendship, the only way to have true love in loving one another is to know doctrine first. Then relationships fall into place. Because you'll know that everyone has a sin nature. You'll have a grace attitude about yourself. And when people screw up, you won't hold it against them. You'll just switch to impersonal love and have your personal love for God. And we will study in detail at some point impersonal love in Matthew when we get to it. Because he's going to give us the two most important commandments. To love God the Father and to have impersonal love for all mankind. This is part of it. The first part, believe in Christ. That's the first will of God the Father. In God the Father, it's His will that no one should perish. Now that's something 
that we could uh, apply to eternal security as well. If it is God the Father's will that no one should perish, then when we believe in Christ, we're saved. And if it's his will that we not perish, he's going to keep us saved. And by the way, it's by, it's by the power of God that we are kept saved, not by our power. We were helpless when we believed. We're helpless after we believe. There's nothing. If you, can, if you say, I can lose my salvation, what you're saying is I have to do something to keep it or I have to not do something to keep it. There's nothing you can do to keep salvation. So, again, now this keeps on being his commandment that we believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he gave us the commandment. Now, that just brings the whole will of God into focus. It's the will of God that everyone believe, and it's the will of God that everyone live their unique spiritual life. And that's the will of Jesus Christ, and that's the will that he talks about when he was rudely interrupted and they said, your family's out here. And he says, these people are my family. And if you do my will, if you believe in me and follow the unique spiritual life, you too will be part of the family. You become part of the family when you believe. You become a mature part of the family when you love one another and when you reach those stages. Now, uh, tomorrow night, we'll move on with parables. And it'll be the uh, first study on parables. It will be an in-depth study on parables because we need to understand what a parable is and when a parable is not. Because there are Jehovah Witnesses who will say, oh, that's just a parable where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. But we'll, we'll come to find out that a, a parable never does include an exact geographical location. And so when uh, it talks about Hades or hell, that's a geographical location. That's not a parable. And there are other reasons why something's a parable and why something is not a parable. But usually in your Bible, it makes it very clear and says, the parable of thus and though, thus and so, the parable of thus and so. And when they get to weeping and gnashing of teeth, they don't say the parable. Even, even they know that much. And uh, some of you might have commentaries at the uh, bottom of your Bible, and that's fine. Some of the commentaries are good, especially if you have a... Uh, uh, who was that guy before the colonel, you know? Schofield. Schofield, that is a very, very good one. He got a few things wrong, but he didn't have a lot of the equipment uh, that is available today, that is for study, to get it right. But Schofield, if you want a good study Bible, that's a, one of the best ones that I know of. I've looked at some of the others, and uh, some of them are laughable. They, they don't even have a spiritual context to it. They'll come up with some human idea just something and I've, I've looked at some of them and they've, they've all they've made me sick or they've made me laugh depending on my mood but uh, some of them are just uh, way off just it's just a human viewpoint and uh, Schofield usually tried to bring out the spiritual aspect and usually had a lot of verses uh, pertaining to it as well that you could counter reference but anyway uh the commentaries aren't that great anyway, especially if you got a good pastor teacher, so it don't really matter. I'm giving it to you right, that you can compare and contrast if you will, but it's right. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to study this portion of the Word. May we come to understand your grace, and may we come to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.